Content warning. Incest, imperialism, and midichlorians. Action! Excitement! Horror! Romance! Thrills and chills! Swords and sorcery! Rockets and ray guns! A dizzying canopy of the strange and impossible from the darkest depths of the human imagination! What mad universe encompasses such tales as these? Join us as we bear witness to the sweeping sprawl of all the history that never was and all the futures that could yet be. It's adventure as you like it on... What What Mad Universe! far, far away, there was a film brat named George Lucas. After achieving some success with his movies THX 1138 and American Graffiti, he pitched the studios on an ambitious science fiction adventure inspired by comic books, Flash Gordon serials, and the works of Joseph Campbell. Sadly, on its release in 1977, the movie, called The Journal of the Wills, from the Chronicles of Luke Skywalker, turned out to be too niche for general audiences, and it bombed at the box office, eventually fading from cultural memory. However, in addition to producing a novelization, ghost written by Alan Dean Foster, a second novel was written based on Lucas's plans for a potential film sequel. This is the story of Splinter of the Mind's Eye, and the Star Wars saga that might have been. Hi, welcome to What Mad Universe. I'm Adam Prosser. With me is Philip Rice. And uh, today, hello. hello. Today we're joined by a special guest, Will Staples. Howdy. Hello. As we know him from Twitter, Phil B. Bot, friend of the show and someone who knows a lot more about the Star Wars Expanded Universe than either of us. More than is healthy. <laughs> Yes, exactly. We do need. We were a little surprised to discover as we sort of geared up for this that neither of us are huge Star Wars EU people. So, um, so it's good to have a third voice on this. So, welcome, Will. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. <laughs> honor to have you. We always Thank enjoy you. having you guys here. Having adding to the What Mad Universe family. Um, so, this is the first of a couple of shows we're planning to do this season, uh, looking at spin-off material novelizations and extended universe content and i hate the word content but it's probably the easiest way to describe what we're talking about uh for the major science fiction franchises and today it's splinter of the mind's eye the first star wars novel aside from the film novelization uh it was published in 1978 but we'll probably take a wide overview of the various star wars novels comics and supplemental material um so yeah this was written um even before uh, Star Wars was released, if I'm not mistaken, uh, well, do you know more uh, about this uh, this this uh, book, like the history of this one? Or as a matter of fact, yes. <laughs> uh, so, um, when uh, Star Wars, the first movie, which we now know as Star Wars Episode Four: A New Hope, I'm just going to refer to it as A New Hope for the sake of convenience. Uh, before it came out, George Lucas did have plans for a film franchise. Um, he knew he wanted to do a sequel, but he wasn't sure how successful the first movie was going to be. And so he had two plans in mind. If the movie was very successful and it made back a lot of money at the box office, he would be able to go ahead with his bigger and better plans, which he did, and that became... Uh, the Empire Strikes Back. If the movie bombed at the box office, uh, he had a f backup plan to do a less expensive kind of B-movie sequel, and that became Splinter of the Mind's Eye. Mm -hmm. Now, Lucas himself did not write the plot to Splinter of the Mind's Eye. Uh, that was actually... Uh, Alan Dean Foster came up with it himself. Uh, mm. Lucas gave him a lot of leeway to do that. Um, I think the only thing that was actually that he actually cut from uh, Foster's draft was a space battle at the very beginning 
simply because they, you know, if it became a movie, they wouldn't have had the budget for that. Right. But yeah, I was uh, curious about that whether, like, because it, it, they everyone credits Foster for this and not Lucas, and I was surprised he wouldn't have had more to do with you know crafting the sequel to his own movie. But yeah, yeah. Uh, well, um, the plot for the book was actually written after it was clear that they would uh, be able to do Empire. Mm. So they they knew already that they weren't. I it's it's kind of confusing to me. Um, I'm. I, I confess, I'm going off of what I read on Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, yes, uh, I also. Um, my understanding is that by the time the book came to press, uh, they already knew that they were going to go ahead with Empire. Uh, but some certain things uh, weren't uh, weren't confirmed yet. For instance, Harrison Ford had not yet been signed for a sequel, so they didn't know if he was going to be in uh, any... You know, any on and if uh, Han Solo was going to be in any more stories going forward, so Han and Chewie are conspicuously absent from this book. I, I mean, he must have had the skeleton of it worked out. Um, when you say they went to press, do you mean like it had already been written at that point, or because it was basically all written before Star Wars was released, was it not? Or is that completely? I believe so, yeah. but I, I can't uh, confirm with any degree of certainty. Right. Yeah, it's it's a little vague, but it but you can definitely feel that like he'd written something that could be filmed on a lower budget than A New Hope, which wasn't hugely budgeted. I mean, it was decent budget for 1977, but not huge budget uh, compared to what came later, of course. Yeah, yeah, this this book essentially takes place on uh, a Hollywood soundstage. Uh, <laughs> the the whole movie takes place on a fog shrouded planet. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a rundown town and uh, some caves and the inside of a temple. It right. would not have been very expensive to film. Yeah, it's it is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, a lot, a lot of fog and and jungles. And you can actually see the um, the the beginnings of um, a few elements they arguably used. Like it does feel a bit like Dagobah in some ways. Yep. And you have. Uh, uh, you know, uh, indigenous aliens who fight back against the uh, the Empire, which feels a bit like proto Ewoks as well. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, they also directly use some elements from this later. Uh, Mimban, Mimban, I, I don't know how to pronounce Mimban. it. Mimban, Mimban um, appears in uh, Solo the mm. movie, um, yes. though it's not a swamp planet there. It's well, it's a the... mud planet. Yeah, <laughs> and of course, then there's the huge element of this th that did find its way eventually, uh, which is the Kyber crystal. Yes, that was the one element of the plot that actually was created by George Lucas. Um, the Kyber crystal, which I believe was originally spelled K Y B E R, uh, in the book it's K I uh, K A I B U R R, uh, but in the one of the early drafts of the movie, uh. The object of uh, Ben Kenobi and Luke Skywalker's, uh, well, their quest, so to speak, is to steal the Kyber Crystal from Darth Vader, uh, which in this early version of the, uh, of the story was what would have allowed them to use the Force. Uh, in, uh, shortly after that, Lucas decided that it, it would make more sense, it would be more consistent with his ideas with the Force if it was just something that people just used, that they wouldn't need an, like an outside talisman to use the Force. But the idea of basically a magic crystal uh, that drives the plot was uh, come up, uh, it is something that George Lucas came up with himself. Hmm, yeah. Yeah, and it, it it's something that I believe sort of kicked around the Star Wars Extended Universe for a while after this, too. Like, you kept hearing yeah, about... Yeah, the kyber crystals are how they make lightsabers. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That ended up being what they finally landed on, was that kyber crystals are a, a part of the, the lightsaber. But I, if I'm not mistaken... in the... And also the Death Star, as, as in Rogue One. Um, but it is interesting though i specifically remember in the lead up to the prequels there was some discussion over whether uh the kyber crystal might play a role in the story of the prequels as well oh really uh, 
I, I it was a and I mean it might have been totally fan speculation, uh, but it, it it just emphasizes that we didn't really know what the Ky it, Kyber Crystal is sort of this lost element from the early drafts of Star Wars. And let's be clear, yeah. there's like how many drafts of Star Wars? Will are there before we got the one that we all know and love? There were a bunch, at, weren't there? At at least five, right? Yeah, and uh, the early ones were so different that they were a completely different story. And in fact, uh, Dark Horse Comics actually published the the mm -hmm. first draft as its own story that was took place in its own universe titled "The Star Wars." Yes, yes, I remember that. <laughs> I always <laughs> picture Han Solo a fish. Is that a thing? Uh, geez, yes, I don't know. There was that, not in that draft, but yes, if I'm not mistaken, in an early version, Han Solo was an alien. Um, and he almost was sort of a proto Jabba the Hutt, too. <laughs> uh, so many different elements kind of got re remixed and reshaped. Uh, like uh, the one dude, uh, De Deke Starkiller, I believe his name was. He oh, was yeah. A yeah, he was he was an early character, and he essentially he was a good guy, but he was essentially the basis for Darth Vader because he had the same cyborg thing of being half machine, half man. Um, yep. And he's in the Star Wars, the 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 uh, the comic series that uh, they released. Uh, but there's but there's all these other drafts as well, and other versions. It's there's versions that are more thoroughly based on the Hidden Fortress by Akira Kurosawa, mm -hmm. which was of course one of the big uh, inspirations for Star Wars in the first place. Um, like versions with no Luke Skywalker. It's it's basically Obi-Wan and Princess Leia and the droids teaming up to save everyone, if I'm not mistaken. And the, the name Starkiller keeps popping up over and over again in uh, Star Wars media, most recently in the form of Starkiller Base in The Force Awakens. Right. That's another thing, like the Kyber Crystal. It's just, it's a thing from the early drafts. They keep kind of trying to use it, and then they finally did get to use it in one of the new movies. Yep. So they said oh, I saw a bit from the droids cartoon that they did, um, and there's a car there's a villain named Kaibo Ren. Oh, yes. really? Kaibo Ren Cha. He was a uh, space pirate. That's in the 80s cartoon? Yes. Wow, really? And he's this little squat Genghis Khan looking guy. Huh. That's crazy. I didn't know Kylo Ren went back that yep. far. I thought that was something new they came up with. Huh. Kai, Kai Bo Ren with a B. Yeah, I, okay, I, yes, sorry, different name. but you, yeah. Well, it's like Kyber Crystal is spelled differently in different iterations. But That's true. Same same basic idea. You know, there's different... Yeah, I saw um, Quentin Reviews. Uh, he did a video on the Droids cartoon and uh, the Ewok one, Ewoks one as well. Mm -hmm. um, it, it seems interesting because they actually... Um, uh, had um, uh, Boba Fett was in one episode, but they made sure the droids didn't meet him. So, because the the droids show was a was a prequel to, uh, right. to the original to A New Hope, mm -hmm. and um, the um, Star Wars Holiday Special, which introduced uh, uh, Boba Fett, didn't uh, had the droids not know who he was. So, mm. um, <laughs> like the the show like went out of its way to to conform to the continuity of the holiday special. That's actually more continuity than they usually showed in the eighties. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> it's more continuity than they showed in the prequels. The prequels are just like oh, oh and true. then they erased uh, <laughs> C three PO's uh, memory, which doesn't even really make sense because R two D two could remember everything and yeah. just tell it to C three PO. <laughs> so yeah, exactly. Oh, he's a jerk. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He likes keeping secrets, as we know. He doesn't tell 3PO anything. So, there you go. They're both jerks. But this is exactly... Th this is the interesting part to me about this um, sort of spin-off media. And, and it's something that I want to talk about. Like I say, we're going to do a couple of episodes, I think. We're going to do a Star Trek episode, probably a Doctor Who episode. And it's kind of... In, bo in all of those cases, there was a period in which the thing... The, the franchise didn't exist in, uh, on screen or at least not in movies or not in t not in its original media it was only in novelizations comics spin-off media and in some cases it was literally like fanzines and fan material um, and yeah. you get all these sort of might have beens and all these deviations and alternate futures for where the series was and that's the interesting thing to me and people and then that people are very quick to sort of 
toss that out and say, oh, well, that's not canon. No, 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 that's not canon. we got to go back to the real canon. And to me, it's like, yeah, but there's interesting stuff there, which we're now seeing with Star Wars, because they are using that stuff in the, quote, official canon that we get. Yeah. I mean, hell, uh, Jackson, the Green Rabbit from uh, the Marvel comic is canon again. Wait, he is? Really? He He is. Oh, my God. Okay, tell people about Jackson. Uh, oh, well. okay, okay. Well, first of all, a little background. Um, people often call Splinter of the Mind's Eye the first expanded universe story uh, for Star Wars. It is not, actually. It was predated by a few months by uh, the seventh issue of Marvel's Star Wars comic uh, mm -hmm. by Roy Thomas and Howard Chaykin, uh, titled New Planets, New Perils, uh, which was a... a, a uh, a, a, a short story arc starring Han Solo and Chewbacca while uh, Luke and Leia were out of focus, uh, having various Western-inspired adventures on this frontier planet. And uh, most memorably, it involves a, uh, a very blatant uh, Seven Samurai uh, plot reference in which Han and Chewie... Uh, hire a group of mercenaries to protect some villagers from uh, some bandits. And one of the people that they hire is a seven-foot-tall green anthropomorphic rabbit named Jackson, who is very obviously supposed to be Bugs Bunny. <laughs> and uh, Roy Thomas justified this uh, by sa because... He saw uh, production stills of the movie. Uh, I don't know if you remember Dr. Evazan, the guy in the, uh, the the cantina who says, I have the death sentence in 12 systems. Okay. He believed that uh, that guy was supposed to be Porky Pig because of his nose. <laughs> I'm not even making that up. Okay, obviously he was being tongue-in-cheek when he said that, right? He didn't literally think the Looney Tunes were going to show up in Star Wars, right? I'm pretty sure. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Well, it's if you look at... There's an early um, um, uh, Ralph McQuarrie uh, production drawing of uh, the, uh, the cantina scene from A New Hope. And in fact... I've always been told that they did some early footage of the cantina. That was one of almost as a test. It might have been something before they actually uh, they actually locked in the the final stuff. It might have you know because they do a lot of uh, early footage just as tests to uh, to pitch it to the studios and so on. Uh, that there was an early film uh, version of the cantina scene um, which had like different aliens and they were a little less imaginative. Mm. Uh, and the the Macquarie drawing you have these aliens that actually do kind of look like rabbits so really? i wonder if that might have been a f it, not green rabbits but <laughs> they're vaguely rabbit looking or, or rodent looking uh, that is uh, quite possible so i wonder if that was an inspiration as well but yeah but anyway yeah jackson and then he stuck around for a while didn't he jackson uh actually no he made uh one cameo appearance a little bit later uh in another uh another issue by the next writer Archie Goodwin, who added two more bounty hunters named Daffy and Fudd. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. And uh, then he disappeared and was basically just remembered as uh, just kind of a bizarre weirdo thing that, that uh, they would rather forget uh, until huh. they finally brought him back in, I think it was like an April Fool's issue of the current Marvel comic, but it's still canon. Oh, oh, okay. See, yeah. when you said he was canon again, I was thinking, oh, is he going to show up in the Clone Wars or something? Oh, he had a cameo in uh, the animated series Forces of Destiny as well. Okay. All right. Oh, and uh, in Clone Wars, there actually is an episode uh, where you see his skeleton. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Well, or one of his species, well, right? yeah, because it yeah, takes yeah. place 30 years earlier. Right, right. And uh, the other thing I'm always uh, insisting about uh, Star Wars is that Sith, uh, that and and you know, somewhat to Lucas's credit and the other people who run Star Wars, they've you know they've they've adapted with it. They haven't been uh, they haven't held to their guns. But he threw out a lot of things that were ideas or half formed 
uh, phrases that he was willing to change, but he probably intended them differently in the early going. And Sith is one of those because Darth Vader is described as the Lord of the Sith. Um, mm -hmm. And what a Sith is was probably, well, I don't even know if he knew what a Sith was at that point. I think it was just a cool we were title. Told. Yeah. In, my, the, my, in one ahead. of the early drafts, the Knights of the Sith were the equal opposites to the Jedi. But that was dropped uh, very early on and not mentioned in any uh, expanded universe material, like until the the late nineties. Oh, okay. See that well, because so that counters what I was going to say. Because what I was going to say was that, um, like, Darth Vader is a Lord of the and B Sith, um, and. Remember, Darth Vader was a Jedi who went bad, and the only other bad Force user we see is the Emperor, who, as far as we know, was never a Jedi, right? Um, so it's kind of the implication that there are Force users, but the Jedi are the ones who use it specifically to do warrior stuff with. And um, so it's because Darth Vader was an ex-Jedi that he has a lightsaber and does all this Jedi stuff there weren't necessarily evil Jedi out there until they needed them for the prequels, basically. That's how I would have interpreted it, but, of course, now uh, there's a whole Yeah, actually, um, <laughs> even in the, uh, you know, when they started, you know, fleshing out the Sith in the, the, the 90s in the Dark Horse comics, they didn't use lightsabers at first. Uh, okay. Yeah, like, so the Sith were appearing in the comics you're talking about here. Uh, yeah, in, there's actually, uh, an interesting story about how the Sith were developed as well. Uh, are you familiar with Timothy Zahn? Yes, I, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, he wrote the, uh, the first of the new wave of, uh, Star Wars novels in the 90s, the Thrawn trilogy, mm -hmm. and, uh, he actually intended to explain what, uh, what Dark Lord of the Sith meant. He intended to introduce a species called the Sith. Uh, who are aliens that Vader was, uh, you know, like, he was secretly their ruler. And uh, Lucasfilm had other ideas for the Sith, and they vetoed that. And that um, became the Nogri species. Right, the, the Nogri. Trilogy. Yes, I have read the Thrawn trilogy that you're talking about, um, the, 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 the Timothy Zahn uh, series. Yep. Uh, that's really interesting. Okay. Yep. Because it's you also wonder, why is he the Lord of the Sith if there's another guy above him, right? <laughs> yeah, the, the Emperor actually was not identified as a Sith until uh, the Phantom Menace. Right, exactly. Um, so that's why it's always been a weird title for him to be the Lord of the Sith. Yeah. And uh, speaking of... Uh, uh, just a little um, uh, aside, uh, Sith was actually um, um, a thing in the Barsoom books, the John Carter novels. Really? Uh, they're, they're a um, giant um, uh, insect that lives in the swamps. Um, that's and I, I assume George Lucas read those, so right. that might have been where that came from. Yeah, yeah uh, I, John Carter is definitely part of Star Wars DNA. Right. Yeah. I don't know if you've uh, listened to our recent shows, uh, Will, but we did uh, one on Lee Brackett, who, of course, was the co-author of uh, Empire Strikes Back, um, and she wrote sort of pulp novels, and that was clearly something Lucas had read uh, going into Star Wars, uh, along with everything else. Um, I, you know, Lucas is pretty imaginative when it comes to names. I wouldn't say he just swiped everything from oh, yeah. from other places, but I'm sure he, you know, he's. What was the um. Uh, it was the video game that uh, they asked him for some Sith names, and he oh. came up with, what was it, Darth Insanius or something? <laughs> Darth Insanius and Darth Icky. <laughs> Darth Icky! <laughs> Darth Icky. And, uh, yeah, they, once he said that, they just sort of, you know, they weren't sure if he was joking or not. <laughs> <laughs> and they're still not sure. But and the Leia thing, obviously, uh, was right. not planned from the beginning. Yes, uh, and it's yeah. very the splinter of the mind's eye suggests with uh, constant asides with uh, uh, <laughs> Luke's inner thoughts, thinking about Princess Leia's. You know, yeah, yeah, that... uh, they're very horny. Yeah, he's yeah. he's pretty horny. He's very goth in the splinter. Of the... Let's go back to splinter of the mind's eye for a bit. Uh, splinter of the mind's eye is goth Luke Skywalker and horny Luke Skywalker. Yeah. Uh, He's both of those. Uh, I also got some sort of brashness to him in, in parts. He seems like he absorbs some of Han Solo's attributes. Yeah, he's in the movie. He's he's of course kind of headstrong, but in the book he comes off as downright arrogant at times. 
Hmm. Uh, it makes sense if he was gonna if they were gonna get rid of Han Solo, uh, you know, they That's needed true. someone to fill the gap. And there's and there's replacement Chewbacca's in this book too. Oh yeah, two of them. <laughs> Yuzems. What's, what's better than one Wookiee is two Wookiee like creatures. Yep, named, Yuzums. Uh, yeah, not, Yuzums. To be, not to be confused with Yuzums, which are a different species. Oh yeah, where are they from? Uh so the Yuzams are these big, hairy, bear-like aliens with kind of like a pig nose, I think, mm -hmm. uh, in this book. The Yuzams, which were also named by George Lucas, uh, they were another species that was supposed to be on the forest moon of Endor in uh, Return of the Jedi, but the puppets they made for them looked terrible, so they left them out. One of them can still be seen in the background of Jabba's palace. Oh, okay, interesting. What were their what were they going to do in the story? Like what role did they play? They were basically like like mean Ewoks. Like they I they they like went to war against the Ewoks and I guess the Ewoks would rescue the rebels from them. Uh, uh they did have a more prominent role in the Ewoks cartoon as the henchman for one of the villains. Oh, yeah, I remember those things. That's right, the Great Ewok Adventure were the there were I think two TV movies about the Ewoks made yep. in the mid '80s, and also an animated series. Yeah, right, that's what I was referring to. Um, and but uh, by the time um, Attack of the Clones came out, I was sort of you know realized this was kind of cheesy. Um, you know the the prequel stuff. I know a lot of people have um, reassessed their prequels, but I still no. There's good stuff there, but I, I have um, the storytelling doesn't really work for me. Yeah. Yeah, I, I have to say my 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 thing about Star Wars, and this is just me. I don't want to step on anyone. You know, at this point, we all have, as we've basically said, everyone has their own filter through which they've seen Star Wars and in which they think of Star Wars. The thing I always appreciated about the original trilogy, and and in my mind, it's the original trilogy, and that's it. And everything else can be entertaining and cool, but it's not even really. Star Wars, as I understand it, it's it's uh, you know either you know alter parallel. It's not even about like it's a parallel reality. It's like it's not doing the same things that the original three movies are doing because the original three new movies are about environmental storytelling in a way that almost nothing else is. It's very much yeah we're building a world and it either impacts the plot or maybe it doesn't. When Obi Wan Kenobi says. Uh, oh yeah, we fought in the Clone Wars. That's a throwaway line. And we later get all this material about the Clone Wars, and I would argue that it's so much cooler as a throwaway line <laughs> in Absolutely. A New Hope. Yeah, than, you know, a movie and, t you know, two TV series and all this other stuff. Like, it, it, it's it's actually a series that tells you, or the original movies are telling you to use your imagination. And it throws it out and then moves on to the next thing. And it even, like... Even when they create these iconic things like X wings or uh, you know lights, uh, you know uh, Tatooine or new planets, it'll use it as long as it needs to for the story, and then be off to the new thing. It's significant that there's only one big X wing Tie fighter scene in the original. Of course, they come back because they're part of the world, but almost everything, you know, there's one big. At, at Walker scene, you know, they're on Hoth for, you know, part of the movie and then they never go back there. Everything is just, oh, let's go to the next thing. Let's build a new planet. Let's go to a new city. Let's go to a new thing. And they keep adding and building to the world. That was one of my big problems with the new series is that they kind of go back to, oh, well, we'll use TIE Fighters again. We'll use that, you know. It's 40 years later. They should have new vehicles. They should have new worlds. They sh Everything should be new to me. Um yeah. But that's just me. That's how I feel about Star Wars. And and at least The Phantom Menace was doing that. <laughs> Whatever you think of The Phantom Menace, it was like, okay, totally new vehicles, totally new worlds, totally new characters, all that kind of stuff. Absolutely. But, yeah, that's my take on it. Uh, uh, also, they, they sort of did that with uh, introducing new Force stuff in each movie, because a lot of people nowadays with the sequels complain, you know, the um, Force projection and all that, you know, they're just adding stuff. But, uh, hmm. I mean, telekinesis wasn't really a thing in the original movie. Um, like, Darth Vader chokes people with his mind, but uh, you don't see people lifting rocks with their mind. And right. Stuff in, That's true. In That's... A New Hope. Yeah. Well, it, yeah. 
I mean, to be fair, that was probably partly a budget thing, but they. Well, yeah, but it, they had they established that in, in Empire Strikes Back, and they established uh, Force Lightning in uh, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, Return of the Jedi. Uh, you know, it's like every movie sort of added new things, and um, uh-huh. uh, yeah. I think a lot of fans are are stuck in you know the the age where they first experienced it, and then everything after that is is new and bad but uh yeah. they, they sort of ignore that there's always been that and yeah the heck, oh the heck in this book darth vader throws a hadoken oh yeah that's right he's got like an energy fist that he uses on luke at one point yeah, yeah that's he, like weird. charges up an energy ball and fires it at, fires it at luke <laughs> which is a pretty crazy thing for a guy to be adding in the second sequel you know, unauthorized yeah. book before it's even been published, you know? Yeah, there's definitely a couple things that jive, don't, don't quite jive with uh, the original movie because it hadn't quite been finished yet, I think, at the time. So, but... And, like, other little things, like R2-D2 is referred to as a D2 unit instead of an R2 unit. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Just yeah. kind of weird stuff. Yeah. And, and... Uh, Vader actually is literally like, "You shot me down." It's like, well, technically Han Solo shot him down. That was <laughs> that wasn't that wasn't Luke who did that in the yeah. in the last movie. So um, you can see that either, although that's a, I guess an understandable <laughs> mistake in the heat of combat. But yeah, there's there's lots of uh, little details like that, and th- th- that's to me that's always the fascinating uh, thing about these these stories. And then because let's not forget that we get you get to 1983. There's a couple of cartoon shows. There's a there's the Ewok adventure type stuff on TV. By about 1986, Star Wars is fading from the collective memory, right? Yeah, the Marvel comic was canceled in 1987. Yeah, okay, so after uh, Splinter the Mind's Eye, they published the Han Solo trilogy by Brian Daly uh, between uh, A New Hope and Empire. And then between Empire and Return of the Jedi, they published the Lando Calrissian Chronicles by L. Neil Smith, uh, nice. who later made a presidential run for the Libertarian Party, but I digress. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and those were actually the only novels that were published uh, before the 90s. Uh, the Marvel comic did uh, run from 1976, before the first movie came out, uh, through to the end of... Uh, no, through to 1987, with a couple of spin-offs. There was uh, there were droids and Ewoks comics, uh, published by Marvel's imprint Star Comics for little kids, hmm. and uh, as well as the uh, Marvel UK Star Wars Weekly comics, which did add a few new strips, including a few stories by a young Alan Moore. <laughs> yes, um, I've seen those. They are wild. Um, <laughs> But uh, from 1987 until the Thrawn trilogy was published in 1991, the only new material that came out for Star Wars was a three-issue comic from Blackthorn Publishing titled Star Wars 3D, uh, which didn't really add anything to the ongoing story, and the uh, Star Wars pen and pencil role-playing game from West End Games. And that is where a lot of the uh, the elements that we now take for granted as part of Star Wars first came from. For instance, it's the first place that uh, the city planet Coruscant was mentioned. Oh. Uh, it's It was the first uh, time we learned that the Wookiees came from a planet called Kashyyyk. And... Um, well, wait a, a minute. Didn't, of... Kashyyyk, didn't Kashyyyk show up in the holiday special, though? Oh, you're right, you're right. I'm scratch that. Uh, Although they might not have given it a name, but they we definitely saw the Wookiee home planet in the holiday special. If I'm not correct, I'm mistaken. Uh, And actually, it was actually fleshed out more than that in the uh, Star Wars newspaper comic. Uh, Okay, but I do think it was fleshed out more again in uh, in the the RPG. But and uh, a lot of droids and uh, vehicles also first made their first appearance there. And that kind of became the the bedrock of the formal expanded universe that was developed in the 90s, starting with the Thrawn trilogy. Mm. 
Okay. I didn't realize that was coming along so late. I always, like, I did read the Thrawn trilogy when it came out, and I remember it being a big deal, but I didn't realize that it was literally the first novel that we'd had in that long a time. I, I always sort of assumed uh, novels got churned out, at least in the early 80s, before, uh, before going dark for a while. Nope, there um, were only seven novels uh, that came out before the Thrawn trilogy, and they all took place either in the time frame of the movies or as prequels. Yeah, the the uh, the only story that uh, moved the plot forward after Return of the Jedi was the Marvel comic by uh, Mary Jo Duffy. You know, she introduced the new villain uh, Lumia, the Dark Lady, mm. and uh, yep, and uh, that uh, the, you know she continued the the storyline forward about six months after uh, Return of the Jedi, and then. Uh, there wasn't anything more after that until the Thrawn trilogy jumped forward about ten years. Right. Yes, I remember. Like there was a female Darth Vader type villain at one point. That and yes. I, I remember seeing that comic. That was weird uh, that that existed. <laughs> uh, this fun is what fact. I'm... Yeah. Uh, the the um, eponymous Splinter of the Mind's Eye, the sh the shard of the the Kyber crystal that mm -hmm. Darth Vader gets his hands on. Uh, it was later retconned that he gave that to Lumia, and that she used that as the focusing crystal in her light whip. Okay, cool. Yeah. And it, but this is at the point where they knew kyber crystals were controlling lightsabers, is what you're saying. Uh, this was at a point when basically any crystal could be used uh, for a lightsaber. Like, you, you could just use a regular diamond as a cool. lightsaber focusing crystal. Uh, right. It was before, like kyber k-y-b-e-r crystals became <laughs> you know the specific kind of crystal that you use to power a lightsaber right well this see this kind of highlights one of the things you run into with expanded universe but even canonical sequels and things uh which is that people want to start tying everything together and being like well we had a death star now we've got a planet-sized Death Star in the next yeah. one, or now we've got we learn out that uh, Darth Vader built C-3PO, and you know, stuff where it doesn't really add anything. It, it shrinks the universe in ways Absolutely. that are a little unfortunate, you know? Oh, uh, that, that actually brings me to an extremely bizarre uh, well, sort of uh, a bit of lore, I guess you could call. A uh, 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 there was this, it started off as an article that was supposed to be published on StarWars.com. Uh, it was actually approved for publication, but, uh, you know, scheduling problems uh, kept it from being published until the Disney buyout when they stopped, uh, they discontinued that feature, so it never actually became canon. But it was titled, uh, Supernatural Encounters in the Star Wars Universe by Joseph Bongiorno who had worked on the West End RPG, I believe. And it is an absolutely fascinating and absolutely bonkers grand unifying theory of the entire Star Wars mythos, which is an absolute trip to read and would have been an absolute disaster if it had actually been made canon. <laughs> okay, what does it say? Okay, so... For one thing, it's it it includes a creation myth for the Star Wars universe, which is something I don't think it really needed. Uh, goes into really bizarre, like religious and uh, mystical stuff, uh, and it, it attempts to tie every every single piece of Force related stuff together. Everything from the Kyber crystal to the weird magic stuff that you see in the Ewoks cartoon to the the you, you know the the mortis gods from the clone wars cartoon all the way down to uh the villain abeloth from the legacy of the force books uh which were the last uh bit of uh expanded universe books before uh the before uh the disney buyout and uh one one bit uh he, he decided to give uh star wars a satan figure in the form of, uh, we mentioned the Alan Moore uh, stories. Uh, one of them was Tilotny Throws a Shape, in which uh, Princess Leia encounters uh, sort of a group of really bizarre godlike beings who 
don't even notice her existence, who just kind of wreak havoc with reality. And uh, he just, uh, Bongiorno decided to make one of them, Talatni, basically the Satan of Star Wars. And uh, the the plot of this uh, essentially novella that he wrote uh, and, uh, basically ends with her turning into uh, a horrible monster and dying of shame because she's very vain. And the kyber crystal is her petrified heart. Does, does, does she by any chance resemble Cthulhu? Oh, I was about to get to that. Okay, all right, go on, go on. That's her son. <laughs> All right. So, um, the the in 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 Splinter of the Mind's Eye, the Temple of Pomogemma, uh, Pomogemma is a vaguely described god who is very obviously Cthulhu. He's a <laughs> big a big scary man with an octopus for a head and dragon wings. Right. And um, Bongiorno, uh, in his novella, which again almost canon but not, uh identifies him with another obscure uh, quasi-god from Star Wars lore, uh, Typhogem, who is associated with the, the Sith. Uh, and he makes him one of uh, Tilatni's uh, offspring, uh, basically the general of her armies. And, the you know, he is killed, and the kyber crystal is put placed... Uh, for put put to rest in his temple on Mimban. It's bonkers. Wow. Okay. So so he really did <laughs> weave everything together and considered Splinter of the Mind's Eye to be canon. That's that's actually an interesting. You're saying like Splinter of the Mind's Eye is the beginning of the expanded universe, and this is like the end of yes. the expanded universe, and it's tying it all together. Yes. That's kind of neat. Um, it, like I said, it is the grand unifying theory of Star Wars, and it is absolutely fascinating uh -huh. if you can find it. He, uh, uh, Joe Bongiorno published it for free on his website, uh, but it, 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 it would have absolutely wreaked havoc with, uh, with basically everything if it had actually been de declared canon. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think it's a stretch to say that, like, yeah, you see things in, like, the Ewoks cartoon and they seem to have magic, and it's like... It's always kind of been implied that there's f the Force out there and that people use the Force, but not necessarily to be Jedi. Just it, it ha And some of them don't even really understand what they're doing and what it is that they use. They just know they have some strange ability that can... And, and, and I mean, that's kind of necessary for something like The Last Jedi, where you reveal that, oh yeah, there's a bunch of Force sensitives out there. They just haven't yeah. been trained as Jedi yet. And the Jedi can be reconstituted from these people. It doesn't come down to one bloodline that is particularly good. It, you know, Luke doesn't have to have 500 yeah. kids to, for the Jedi to <laughs> to come back. There's, there's a, you know, it's something that's always been out there. So that, you know, that's not too wild in that yeah. sense. Like uh, um, Hala, the old woman but, in this story. she She's force sensitive, but she was mm -hmm. never trained as a Jedi. And of course, ironically... Uh, there's they... also talk about... Um, uh, in this, in the splinter of the mind's eye, at least, um, there are other force sensitives among the Empire, right. and they don't actually think that the the Alliance has any force. That's people. interesting. I hadn't noticed. Right. That. Yeah, they make yeah, a big thing. Just a brief line about oh, that. Oh, that that also reminds yeah, they me. Make... I, I recall uh, an offhand mention in the book that uh, some of the stormtroopers are women. Yeah, uh... yeah, it does mention men and women. Yeah. Oh, I miss. I actually overlooked that. Of course, that is now yeah. canon as well. But there you go. <laughs> uh, and it does make a certain amount of sense. Uh, they're just sort of rounding up everyone who can work. More for women stormtroopers. Um, oh, uh, putting in elder gods into, <laughs> into Star Wars reminds me of uh, our last uh, episode, uh, which is um, a sort of precursor to Han Solo type character um, fighting Lovecraftian horrors every right. every story. I'll have to check That's that out. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, the the, uh, the it's the Northwest Smith series by C. L. Moore. I, I think it really is clear that Lucas read a lot of this kind of pulp oh, stuff. Yeah. Like he he does know a lot of this stuff, uh, whether he's acknowledging it or not for legal reasons. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because that's something I think I don't think we talk about as much. I think Lucas actually kept some of his influences quiet because he didn't want to get sued, but that that it was out there. I've always been convinced, for instance, that. Uh, the Fourth World series uh, by Jack Kirby was a big influence on really? Star Wars. Um, yeah, look oh, at yeah. that. Oh, um, yeah, I've actually, this is a common uh, 
thought Mark Hamill actually talked about it in an interview I read. Oh, there's mm-hmm. the source. What did he say? Yeah, well, there's the source. There's the fact oh, that the Dark villain side. is named Dark Side. His his bad his his arch nemesis is his son, um, and he has a it's a planet, but it's an all mechanized planet that shoots out energy. Like there's there's a lot of similarities right. there, basically. Plus the whole basic idea of like Kirby was literally doing the idea of can we bring out this sort of Jungian mythological stuff into a more science fiction setting and make it, you know, it's the new gods, right? It's it's the mythology, but for a new age. And that's exactly what Lucas was doing with Star Wars, right? He was tying it into Joseph Campbell and, and, uh, and, and uh, yeah, the Jungian type mythos and fairy tales and the, the monomyth. That's really interesting. Yeah. I, I also, also want... Uh, also, Barsoom stuff. A lot of, a lot oh, of yeah, influences. Yeah. Well, like, like uh, I said, Attack yeah. Attack of the Clones, the whole arena thing is basically taken from Princess of Mars. Mm-hmm. Which made yeah, the and, um, the eventual adaptation of that seem like you know, like it because everything had been done already. Yeah, by and, the time and, uh, the John yeah. Carter movie came out. <laughs> well, yeah, and and the like Return of the Jedi. Uh, of course, the visuals, not necessarily a story, but when he's on a sand skiff uh, and Le- Princess Leia's dressed like Dejah Thoris, you know, it right, becomes yeah. pretty obvious <laughs> that he's ripping on the Barsoom books at that at, for that scene at least. And, and, of course, hiring Lee Brackett, who had done very um, John Carter-inspired uh, sci-fi pulp stuff to write Empire Strikes oh, Back. Uh, speaking of Leia, um, you mentioned in the in the notes here, and I agree, that uh, she, in the splinter of the mind's eye, she basically has PTSD from her torture <laughs> from the first movie. Mm-hmm. Right, yeah. This is the only place I've seen them acknowledge how messed up Leia would be from the events of A New Hope and how she'd be, uh, she'd be, and she ha- kind of hates Darth Vader more than Luke does because of everything that happened to her, right? Oh yeah, she has a lightsaber yeah, fight could, with him. She right? yeah, Darth she, Vader before Luke does. And, and it's funny that they keep saying like, oh, there's Force sensitives out there and Leia's like, well, I wish I could sense the Force. She's, she's got no Force sensi- sensi- sensibility at all. But then she ends up whipping out a lightsaber, fighting Darth Vader with a lightsaber at the climax of this book. So that's kind of foreshadowing. And, and in a to weird be way. fair, Darth Vader is basically toying with her during the fight, but um, it's still like she, you know, mm-hmm. holds her own for a little bit. Yeah, and with I mean, no training whatsoever. Yeah. So the, you know, all yeah. the people complaining about Rey and oh my God. <laughs> Force Awakens, you know, even as late as you know, Rise of Skywalker, we are seeing alternate versions and i don't know if you guys have heard about this they recently did talk about uh an intended earlier draft of rise of skywalker which probably had uh colin trevorrow the original director's input into it did you hear about this Uh, well um they discussed it it, it, uh, and i guess there's some discussion over whether this was real or not um but it uh it doesn't do a lot of the stuff that people complained about with the rise of skywalker uh including it doesn't walk back the uh ray is not related to anyone important stuff which uh was my biggest single problem with that movie um but another thing that happens Um, you you mean you liked that in last jedi but didn't like that they walked it back exactly yeah i i I, to be clear her being nobody is a very good movement because it's it reemphasizes it's not about these two families forever uh and palpatine does not come back in this draft that was discussed um he w- instead they go to the sort of secret sith planet which does end up being in rise of skywalker uh but instead it turns out there's sort of a the original sith god who is described as very much lovecraftian and very much as a tentacled super being uh, and that's Kylo Ren's big mission is he, he's trying to find this lost Sith planet. It makes a little more sense than what we got in the final movie. Um, and it, it, it does give them a good final boss without kind of having to say, oh, the Emperor didn't die, you know? It's, it oh, reveals... Somehow the Emperor returned. Yeah, exactly. Somehow Palpatine came back. Uh, instead, yeah. it's, it's, oh, yeah, no, there was this uber Sith god uh, all this whole time who's just been waiting to be reawakened. And that's the other thing about all this uh, EU stuff that we're talking about. A lot of it was essentially uh, fans getting sort of a yeah. leg in uh to the to the world absolutely right? like uh i mean alan dean foster from what i've seen he as well as star wars he wrote uh a lot of the star trek novelizations uh the alien novelization 
Um, he was the novelization guy for yeah. years, basically. Him and uh, Kevin J. And, Anderson, and, who also wrote a lot of uh, uh, Star Wars uh, books. Right, yes. Kevin J. Anderson was kind of the, the other big go-to guy for Star Wars material, from what I've seen. Um, and, and it, it you, you know, you look at that, and we'll talk about it probably more when we talk about Star Trek. Because we're going to do a Star Trek show for this stuff as well. But it was really like there was a bridge between fandom and the the official canon material uh, that doesn't exist as much anymore. We talk about like, oh, we want the canon. We want, you know, we want to know what's real and what isn't. But by having like this bridge between someone making a fanzine in their basement and the movie that got made. And in between there's like novelizations, spinoffs, tie-ins. And they can hire people from the fandom and the conventions to work on them. You know, it, it, it democratizes it. I think that's really yeah. cool. I actually really like that. And even though it, it gets frustrating to say, well, they came up with stuff that isn't, quote, the real material. And, oh, it contradicts with what I wanted. Yeah, but it it, it creates a diversity, essentially, <laughs> that, that, it, that, it, that feeds. And you've been discussing this, and even Star Wars has been pulling from this and putting it into canon. We've, we, I think you, Thrawn has recently been pulled into canon as yes, well, correct? Yes, he is a major character in uh, uh, Star Wars Rebels animated series. Right. Uh, Did Mara Jade show up in that as well? No, ever? they have been conspicuously keeping Mara Jade out of the new canon. I, I think mm. it's because, uh, for those who don't know, Mara Jade was Luke Skywalker's wife in the... Uh, in the um, uh, old expanded universe, and there's really no way to fit her in in that role, uh, based on mm. what happens to Luke in the the new movie trilogy. That's yeah, fair enough. Uh, that's where, of course, it starts to clash. But it is a bit of a shame because she was a love interest for Luke Skywalker, which is something that that didn't happen. They they had kind of a good, interesting adversarial relationship in the Thrawn trilogy. <laughs> Because she was hired to oh, kill him. A pretty cool character in her own right. Yeah, and plus, you know, hey, it's nice to have another major female Star Wars character before Rey came along or yeah. before Padme came along. Um, also, they haven't brought back uh, Luke. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> I, that's that's one of the only things I know about Luke. this era. But yeah, there's a clone of Luke with two U's. Yeah. Uh, in... Chewie gets uh, a moon oh. dropped on him, right? It's a little more dignified than yet than that, but yes, a moon okay. falls on Chewbacca and kills him. What what story was that, uh, by the way? That when was, was that? Vector Prime, uh, the first book in the New Jedi Order trilogy. Uh, not trilogy; it was actually nineteen books long. But <laughs> uh, uh, it was it was the first book uh, in the new uh, initiative of novels that came out uh, after the license moved to, I think, uh, Del Rey books from Valentine. And uh, okay. they decided, uh, because uh, they couldn't really do much with Chewbacca in uh, prose because he doesn't speak, they decided to just kill him off. And mm. the reason <laughs> they decided to throw out the old expanded universe when Disney bought out Star Wars was because they wanted to have Chewbacca in more movies. Yeah, and that that actually plays up one of the things about all this, which is that, uh, again, I've, I, I always say to me, the ones that to me are Star Wars doing what Star Wars is supposed to do are the first three, because they are movies. They are very, they're very focused on the art and the craft of s cinema. Um, and they're using the tools of cinema. And when you move it to prose or comics, not that you can't have interesting stuff with it, but you're kind of taking it out of its element to me. It's a very much a movie in the same way that Star Trek and Doctor Who are TV shows more than they're, they're something else. And superheroes are comics. It's not that you can't do them in other media. It's just that they're very specially keyed into uh, the, using that media to its... You know, it's 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 uh, peak, and Chewbacca is a great example of that because he, he he works best as a as a movie element. He's a visual element, yes. right? Honestly, my attitude towards Star Wars is that there everything is canon, so really there is no canon. Yes, as far as I'm concerned, everything has as much weight as you want to give it. Mm -hmm. And honestly, 
I have more affection personally for the weird old novels and comics than I do for, say, the prequels. Right. Uh, they they have more weight to me. They they matter more to me uh, in defining what Star Wars is. And yep. a, a lot of other people feel completely the opposite. They are way more invested, for instance, in the current movies that came out. And that is entirely valid. I respect that. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the beauty of a multimedia uh, universe. Yeah, exactly. You've, you've got... You've got at this point there are so many different generations and so many different filters through which to see yeah. Star Wars. I mentioned my you know my nephews, they experienced through the Lego stories. Some people must have experienced it. I know I have a friend who's in love with the role playing game. You know that's a huge part of it, and the and the video games. There was a period where Star Wars was almost primarily video games, from what I can that's tell. That's true. Um, you know uh, that I have a friend who has. Um... Uh, only seen The Force Awakens and the Holiday Special and Turkish Star Wars. So. <laughs> but this is what's so great. This is like a window into the world where Star Wars is something like, you know, the classical myths or fairy tales of old where people just retell it and retell it and it gets passed down and nobody's policing it and it mutates in all these crazy ways which become yeah. distinct in and of themselves. And, you know, if it wasn't a huge corporation, you know, holding it in a death grip, who knows what kind of weird and interesting forms it would take. It's actually oh, good God. to let People it seen that. the movie uh, Reign of Fire with the dragon apocalypse? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we meet some of the characters reenacting oh, Star yeah. Wars in front of the kids um, and saying that they wrote it. Right. Yeah, that's a cool bit. And people are like, yeah, exa- that's exactly it. It's someone going, in the before times, they used to tell this story of, and then he tells the, he tells the events of Star Wars. For that matter, there's a scene in Star Wars where... Uh, where uh, C-3PO is telling the events of Star Wars to the oh, Ewoks. Yeah. <laughs> and it kind of reflects this whole attitude of like, well, now he's getting... Oh, also yeah. the bit of the, the Last Jedi at the end, which uh, I really liked uh, the um, the kids telling the story of Luke Skywalker facing off against the First Order. Right, um, exactly. It's sort of, that to me, captured the whole thing. And that's the whole point of it, right? It's a Joseph Campbell, uh, you know, huddling around a campfire telling these stories from generation. He's trying to capture that vibe, uh, but for our modern mythology, which would be space opera, basically, and comic book stuff. Um, so that, I think, is very... It would be another aspect that would, that's very true to it, is to have all these weird mutations and diversions and, and deflections. Well, did you have anything else you wanted to add? Uh, no, uh, just... Thank you so much for letting me ramble about Star Wars for an hour and a half. Oh, it was this a pleasure. Is basically my dream. Yeah, no, we're 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 one. It's amazing that we had someone who knew so much about Star Wars. Like I said, neither of us are huge EU guys, so uh, it was great uh, great to have you here. Um, and uh, Do you have anything to plug? Uh, not a whole lot. You can follow me on Twitter uh, at Philby Pot F I L B Y P O T T one word. I tweet a lot about comics. Uh, Yes, and if you follow Philby and go back through his tweets to learn about Trioculus, who we did not discuss in this episode. Trioculus is the greatest Star Wars character of all time, and I will brook no argument. <laughs> he has three eyes. That's why his name is Trioculus. <laughs> it's not complicated. He's not Darth Trioculus, but almost, that's almost on the same level. Anyway, well, that's it for What Mad Universe. Uh, We are Adam Prosser, the anthropomorphic green rabbit, and Philip Rice, the secret tentacled Sith god. Thanks again to our special guest, keeper of the Holocron Library, Will Staples. Uh, Shout out to our engineer and producer, Alex Ross, who maintains the Rebel Communication Network, and Max Rebo's fill-in bassist, Jack Furyk, who wrote the theme song. Uh, Once again, if you're listening to the publicly available version of the show, I want to remind people that a longer version will be available on our Patreons. Just look under Philip Rice or Adam Prosser at patreon.com or go to neversleepsnetwork slash series slash what dash mad dash universe for the links. Uh, And if you sign up, you also get comics, illustrations, and other stuff, and you'll help us afford the hosting and recording costs. Uh, You can also get this podcast via iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or your podcaster of choice. And if you enjoy it, please leave a review. Uh, It would also help uh, help us if you'd spread the word about What Mad Universe. Tell your friends or link to us on social media. We would appreciate it. Philip's on Twitter as SpearHalfOck, with an F, underscore. And I'm Prankster36. As mentioned, Will is Philby Pot, with an F and two Ts. 
And the show itself is WMU Podcast. All of those on Twitter. Until next time, good night, and may the power continue to hang around you. I wish there was a cooler way to say that. Good night, everyone. <laughs>